All right, thank you very much. So, uh, as Dr. Nikhil stated, I'll be speaking to you today about how you can actually predict visual recovery once you've made the diagnosis of the optic neuropathy. And so I will be talking about conditions that cause disc swelling as well as those that do not. I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. So you're all now expert in most of the conditions I'll be discussing. There's no real diagnostic dilemma. The question is more, how do we know if this patient is going to get better or not? And I'll walk you through some cases. In this first case, again, you've had a wonderful talk from Dr. Jyothi about NAION, and this is a typical case of 55-year-old man with vascular risk factors who lost vision in his right eye while watching television, has an RAPD, has the swollen sectoral uh, optic nerves here, and a contralateral disc at risk. She spoke to you about how we predict recovery in those patients, that 40% of them will have some degree of visual acuity recovery if they started out at 2063 or worse. Very important to remember that, and that only 25% will have acuity, will have field recovery. Unfortunately, there's not much else I can tell you that will help you to understand who is going to get better. The majority of patients simply will not, and this is an area of active research. So some areas where we do have some better techniques. Uh, again, a, a 24-year-old a young woman, previously healthy, presenting with vision loss in her right eye, subacutely, like looking through a fog, she reports some pain with eye movement and a mild right-sided headache. You're already thinking in your mind what this might be because she has decreased acuity in that right eye. She has a central scotoma by perimetry. She has an afferent pupillary defect, and you find that she has very poor color vision as checked by the Hardy-Rand-Riddler plate. Her fundus is normal in appearance. As uh, Dr. B. Rao told you, up to 70% of patients with this condition, which is, of course, optic neuritis, will not have disc swelling. In terms of predicting visual recovery, the presence or absence of disc swelling in optic neuritis is not the most important thing. We know that the majority of these patients, as he mentioned, do get better. And in fact, this patient at first recovered vision to 2040, and she regained some of her color vision, even though her contrast sensitivity was still reduced. So you say to yourself, okay, fine, but now she presents again with new vision loss in her right eye. And at this point, she's now counting fingers acuity. She can no longer see the color plates again, and she has a definite afferent pupillary defect in that eye, and she has moderate optic disc pallor. So now you have a patient who has recurrent optic neuritis, and recurrent optic neuritis is a different entity from the typical demyelinating optic neuritis. It may just be associated with MS, and the patient may simply be unlucky. But what further investigations should we do to try to predict the visual prognosis? So uh, in recent recent years, one of the most important uh, discoveries, I think, has been of the NMOIG, which I'm sure you're familiar with, the uh, antibody against aquaporin-4 that was detected in patients who have the full-blown spectrum of neuromyelitis optica. 70% of patients who have the full-blown NMO with the transverse myelitis and optic neuritis will be NMOIG positive. But if you look at patients just with recurrent optic neuritis, you can see that in a cohort of 25 patients, 5 of them, 20%, had NMOIG positive. More importantly, that NMOIG positivity was a significant prognostic indicator of poor outcome. All of them had poor acuity, 2,200 or worse, whereas only two-thirds of those who were seronegative had that same poor outcome. In a separate cohort of patients who had recurrent optic neuritis, 50% of patients who were of NMOIG positive went on to develop the full-blown NMO spectrum, the transverse myelitis, very poor neurologic outcome, compared to only one of 15 patients who were seronegative, and that's shown here graphically. And so why does it make a difference? It makes a difference in terms of treatment. You heard about the use of immunomodulatory agents, things like Avonex or beta seron or Copaxone. Those agents are ineffective in patients who have the neuromyelitis optica spectrum of disease. And in fact, there are data to suggest that that treatment may be harmful to those patients. In contrast, the use of immunosuppressive agents, agents like azathioprine, uh, <coughs> mycophenolate mofetil, or even rituximab is a much better approach and may prevent disease progression. Well, how about using OCT for prognosis? We know from a number of studies, including from my institution, that Patients who have optic neuritis have a thinner RNFL, and patients who have multiple sclerosis, even if they have never had optic neuritis, also have a thin RNFL. What we find, is, and this is demonstrated here, that patients just with MS and no optic neuritis have thinner nerve fiber layer than in normal controls. 
If you look in patients who had optic neuritis, their retinal nerve fiber layer is even thinner. But the problem with that is there is nothing prognostic about this. It is simply a long-term effect. If you look initially when patients present with their acute disease, what you see is actually edema in the retinal nerve fiber layer. Even if the disc is not visually swollen, OCT will detect that swelling and they will have a thicker than normal RNFL. So you simply cannot use OCT for prognosis in patients with optic neuritis. What has been suggested in some recent work by a colleague of mine is the use of MRI scan, and specifically diffusion tensor imaging. Diffusion tensor imaging makes use of the fact that the white matter that makes up the optic nerve restricts the movement of water. You can imagine that there are these tightly bundled axons, and water can diffuse only along particular pathways because of the tight tissue structure. However, if you look at patients who have had optic neuritis or have optic neuritis, and you look at how much their vision has declined, So you see that category here. There are various factors that show that diffusion-related indices will increase, showing that there's breakdown of tissue and that there is a linear correlation between that breakdown in the DTI parameters and the degree of visual loss. So when you see the so that's a nice correlation there. Well, what about prediction? Well, they followed the same cohort of patients over time, and as you can see, many of these factors, again, which describe a breakdown in normal tissue structure, many of those factors improve over time. And axial diffusivity, radial diffusivity, you think about the optic nerve as a three-dimensional structure, axial along the length of the tissue, radial along the short axis of the nerve. Most of those change significantly. But what they found was that it was axial diffusivity in particular. I show you all of these to show you there wasn't much difference between patients who did not recover and those who did when you look at the parameters as a whole. But in particular, when you look at the axial diffusivity, there was a definite difference in the patients who didn't recover compared to those who did recover when they first presented. So this is one method we could use acutely in patients with optic neuritis to understand better who is going to recover and who is not. Again, an expensive technique, a specialized technique, but one that shows future promise. Let's move on to some other cases. In this case, a 54-year-old gentleman who uh, noticed that uh, he was actually having some dizziness and was lightheaded. He is a family friend of ours, and this is a bad prognostic indicator if you don't need an ophthalmologist. But uh, he had no visual problems, but he underwent an MRI scan that showed this here. This is a coronal MRI with gadolinium contrast, and I think you can all appreciate that the chiasm is stretched and compressed on top of a cystic and heterogeneously enhancing suppressed or lesion, likely a pituitary adenoma. Well, this gentleman, like most of us, was very busy, decided after this he would, you know, he got a visual field test that showed that he did indeed have a very subtle bitemporal hemianopia, but because he was having no visual problems, did not really seek any further treatment. And so this was his MRI scan in 2006, and then he eventually went back and got another one in 2011, and now you can see that there is a marked increase in size of the tumor and that there is further compression and distension of the optic chiasm, and his bitemporal hemianopia has significantly worsened as well. So this patient comes into your office and you're examining him and you see that the optic nerves have this appearance. I think you would all agree this is a relatively normal appearing optic disc. There is no swelling based on all the characteristics you were told earlier, but there's also no significant pallor. So what can we use? Well, OCT of the retinal nerve fiber layer here can be a very useful prognostic indicator. And so in a study done by uh, Helen Danish Meyer and her colleagues, it was demonstrated that if you looked at the preoperative peripapillary nerve fiber layer thickness in patients with pituitary adenoma, there seemed to be a real cutoff point beneath which there is very little likelihood of visual field recovery, and that appeared to be around 80 microns of RNFL thickness, 75 to 80 microns if you look at the chart a little more critically. And so, well, what can we say in this patient? Before moving on to that, it does not make a difference whether the patients had minimal of dysfunction to begin with, or whether they had a lot of dysfunction of their visual field to begin with. In both cases, mild or severe, if you had a thin RNFL to begin with, you were not likely to improve. In a separate study uh, showing the same thing, uh, it was demonstrated that patients who had incomplete recovery, again, were much different in their RNFL thickness compared to patients who had a field defect or had no field defect before they underwent surgical decompression of the chiasm. So in this patient, his RNFL thickness was measured, and you can see it was about 77 microns, right very close to that cutoff, but above what we think would herald good visual recovery. And in fact, after he underwent surgery and decompression of the chiasm, he had virtually complete recovery 
recovery of his hemianopia. Well, how about this patient, a, f a younger woman uh, who noted that she was having trouble seeing cars on her left side while she was driving. Her acuity was normal. It was thought she might have CSR, was sent to a retina specialist who felt that because of her low myopia, she could have a myopia-associated condition like a, a blind spot enlargement or mutes. But then it was felt perhaps she was having trouble seeing to the right as well. And these are her visual fields. We well, can see here a dramatic change in uh, you know, a dramatic bitemporal hemianopia that is present in her. And so she underwent an MRI scan of the brain, and she had uh, a pituitary adenoma with definite chiasmal compression and thinning of her chiasm as well. But what do we see here? We see that when her RNFL was measured, that she has a significant thinning here, down to 71 microns, uh, 78 microns here, and rather concerning when you look overall at her retinal nerve fiber layer, that there might be a lesser chance of her recovering based on the data I already showed you. Well, these are her visual fields after surgery. She had a dramatic recovery of visual field, despite the fact that based on some of the information I showed you, her RNFL thickness was abnormal. What do I want you to take away from this? I think we should learn that patients who have a normal retinal nerve fiber layer, despite the severity of their visual field defects, are very likely to recover. However, those who have thinner RNFL are not doomed to have their visual field defect present forever. They also may have the ability to recover visual field. It's just that their prognosis may be slightly worse. Their outlook is a little bit worse. And when you counsel them preoperatively, you have to tell them that. But you should not. And I think some people might use these data to say that if the patient already has a thin RNFL, don't bother doing surgery because they're not going to recover. Please don't take that message away. Well, how about other tumors? Those findings that we see patients who recover despite what the literature would say led us to look in particular at skull-based meningioma, which is a particular interest of our group. And we looked at patients who had paracellar, supercellar, or optic nerve meningiomas who underwent either uh, surgery or radiation therapy or a combination of both and had RNFL data available pre- and post-operatively. And we uh, found that we were, uh, had up to one year follow-up on them, and we defined the RNFL thickness as being abnormal normal if it was less than the fifth percentile of normal. And so you can see that, of course, that was statistically significant, 66 microns uh, overall compared to 95 microns in the normal patients. We did find that, however, these other factors were similar between the two groups. And what we did find, similar to the studies with pituitary adenoma, was that <coughs> there is a significant in, uh, improval in, uh, in, uh, improvement in visual acuity, color vision um, in the patients with the normal compared to the thin RNFL, as well as in the foveal threshold and the mean deviation of the visual fields. Again, a significant improvement in patients who are normal and a less significant improvement in patients who had a thin RNFL. But if you look at the distribution of the outcomes, it is very different from what was seen with the pituitary adenomas. You remember with the pituitary adenomas, it was suggestive that all the patients with a normal RNFL had good recovery. The patients with a thin RNFL had much decreased recovery. Here you can see that even patients with very thin RNFL had a significant improvement in their mean deviation when it is expressed either as an absolute value or when it's expressed as a percentage. So when you look at a percentage in change of the mean deviation, even again, patients with a thin RNFL had the ability for improvement, and patients with a thick RNFL, was, it was not a guarantee that they were going to improve. Again, granted, some of these patients had very minimal visual field defects to begin with. Our findings, I think, tell us that the RNFL in more chronic diseases, the more chronic diseases like meningioma, where you have a perhaps microinfiltration of the optic nerve by the tumor as opposed to a pure compressive etiology like you get with pituitary adenoma, or you get some degree of vascular compromise either from the surgical treatment or from radiation, may have a more complex uh, prognostic value, a more pro uh, complex prognostic situation where the OCT may not have as much value, and we are currently using DTI imaging to try to get a better idea of how we can predict what the visual outcomes are going to be in these patients after treatment. So in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with the ideas that disease-specific markers may well predict visual outcomes in optic neuropathies, the uh, NMOIG in patients with recurrent optic neuritis, uh, 
the appropriate testing can help guide medical and surgical decision making. With optic teritis, we may be able to uh, predict at the uh, initial presentation with axial diffusivity if these patients are going to have visual recovery. And finally, structural measures of optic nerve status are inadequate on their own to allow you just on that basis alone to predict whether visual recovery is going to occur or not. Thank you very much.